All right, thank you, Amy. I promise to be short and open this up, but first, just for the heck of it. Zev, is this good? <laughs> 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 All right. Okay, good. My mother always said that I'm a rule breaker. So I might break it another time. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I really uh, I want to give the stage over to Yehuda because we're honored and privileged to have him here all the way from Mexico City. He's a brilliant teacher, as you'll notice, with a depth of knowledge and a depth of character. Those two don't often come together. A depth of knowledge and a depth of character that is very beautifully conveyed in his uh, teachings. But first I want to share with you a story and connect that to a Talmudic anecdote. And then uh, we'll uh, connect both of those to Yehuda and I'll let Yehuda continue from that point on. But this is a story that was published just a few years ago. A story about a man by the name of Dan Eisenblatt who uh, invites, until this very day, guests that don't have a place to go to for Shabbat dinner. He finds them in the streets of Jerusalem where he lives, and he finds them sometimes in his local synagogue. One night, on a Friday night, he went to synagogue. He was uh, following this custom, and he invited anyone and everyone that didn't have a place in synagogue to come over to his house. At one point, he introduced himself to a person he's never seen before, and he said, hi, my name is Dan Eisenblatt. The man responded, hi, my name is Maki. Weird name already. But Dan says, okay, Maki, do you have a place to go to tonight? Maki says, no. He says, can you come over to my house? He says, yeah, sure, please, I'll come. Dan invites Maki over. Maki is asked to sing Shalom Aleichem, to welcome the angels of Shabbat. He doesn't know a word. He's asked to do the Kiddush. He doesn't know how to do it. Throughout the meal, Dan tells Maki, do you have a favorite song? Maki says, the song we just sang at synagogue, something with Dodi, can you sing that song for me? He said, yeah, sure, you mean Lecha Dodi? He says, yeah, yeah, Lecha Dodi. They sing the Lecha Dodi. After they finish singing Lecha Dodi, he tells Maki, is there another song you'd like to sing? Maki says, actually, I like that song a lot. Do you mind singing it a second time? <laughs> Dan says, yes, yeah, sure, and he sings it a second time with his family and the rest of the guests. Then he tells Maki, okay, any other song? Maki says, no, please, I really love this song. Can you sing the Chadudi again? He says, fine. He sings the Chadudi three times, four times, five times that evening. At the end of the evening, Dan goes to Maki and he says, look, we don't really have much time to speak, but uh, where are you from? Maki says, I'm actually from Ramallah. Dan says, you mean Ramle, right? I have a good friend there, maybe you know Yitzhak Weinberger. He says, no, 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 you got me wrong. I'm not from Ramle, Maki tells him. I'm from Ramallah. He says, Ramallah? Ramallah, by the way, if you don't know, in Israel that there's not one Jew lives in Ramallah. He says, how can you be from Ramallah? Maki says, I'll tell you the truth. First, my name is not really Maki. <laughs> Maki is really a nickname for Muhammad. That's my real name. My full real name is Muhammad Ibn Sharif. He says, then what are you doing here? Maki says, well, actually, just a few days ago, I escaped from my house. I have a father who's been abusive towards me since my birth. And I told my mother, now I'm old enough to leave the house. I'm not coming back. My mother, instead of being sad and shocked, she was happy for me. And she said, that's great. You're leaving the house, I hope you're going to the Jews. He said, yes. He says, well, I'm so happy because that's who you are, you are Jewish. And he says, wow, why? She says, because I've never told you, but I'm Jewish. So, logically speaking, you're Jewish too. By going to the Jews, you'll be going back to your roots. Dan Eisenblatt is listening to the story says to Muhammad, Maki, do you have anything that proves your Judaism, any documents that your mother maybe gave you when you left? And the, uh, Muhammad says, yes, I actually have a few documents and I also have a few pictures that my mother gave me of the graves of our ancestors that are here in Israel, including the grave of my great-great-grandfather, who my mother said was a very holy rabbi. He's buried somewhere in the north of Israel. Dan says to Muhammad, can I see those pictures? He says, sure. He pulls out the picture from his little bag. And they go through the pictures of the graves. He says, where's your great-grandfather? He says, here's this 
picture of the grave of my great grandfather is buried in the north of Israel. Dan looks at this picture and he's shocked. He says to him, do you know who your great great grandfather was? He was a holy Kabbalist buried in Sfat. His name is Rabbi Shlomo al Kabetz, and he was the author of the song that you love so much. Lechadodi. <laughs> now I know why you love it so much. Muhammad and Dan really developed this beautiful friendship. Today, Muhammad is Mordechai. He lives in Israel. He's married, has five children, and lives a beautiful Jewish life and remains friends with Dan until this very day. Why am I telling the story? Because my friends, in us, we have a song. The Talmud says that when we are, uh, before we are born, there's an angel that comes to our mother's womb and teaches us the entire Torah. When we leave the womb, the angel slaps up on our face, on our faces, and he uh, that we forget everything. So the commentary is asked, then why teach us the Torah if we're anyway going to forget everything? And the answer is so that the Torah is an inherent part of every Jew. It's a part of us. It's a song that we once sang together with the angel. And when we're studying Torah throughout our lives, we're actually only rediscovering the song, a song that our soul already knows. That's what we do. In us, there's a song. In us, there's an angel still singing. In us, there's a Rabbi Shlomo al kabetz In us, there's a Lecha Dodi. And the question that we have to ask ourselves in life is, are we exploring it? Are we allowing the song? to play itself by itself sometimes? Are we giving it room? Are we allowing it to elevate us? That's what Kabbalah does. Kabbalah doesn't teach you what's there. It teaches you what's here. It does teach you what's there, but it teaches you how the there is connected to the here. And there's no better teacher than Yehuda Grunman <laughs> to teach you what's here. What is the song? How do you access it? How do you play it? How does it sound like? What tunes should you be looking for? Today, as mentioned, we have really the privilege of having Yehuda from Mexico City. We will no doubt delve into this li these little secrets. Thank you for teaching us how to sing our song. Thank you for the intro, Thank you. my God. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you heard, I am a construction engineer. And about 28 years ago, I made a switch from internal, from external construction to internal construction. And uh, it's interesting because I really, really figured out or realized that the methodology was, OK, you will appreciate structure. But most of us don't perceive spirituality to have structure. You know, God is a general concept, spirituality is a general concept, you know, what to do is general, and we need to put it together, and many people go, I don't know what the heck it's for, so I'm doing my best, but, you know, I'm probably not doing it right. And the question is, how do we start accessing some of the inside? I'd like to read to you a quote from the Kabbalist about what Kabbalah is. And it's pretty profound because it really gets you to think about what your perception of Kabbalah and spirituality in general was before. The Kabbalists teach, and I quote, Kabbalah is the universal spiritual wisdom that existed before all of the religions and is the wellspring and source of all the world's religions. Now that's profound, because a lot of people would label Kabbalah Jewish mysticism, right? And by the way, just the word mysticism, to help us understand what we don't understand, mystic mysticism is everything you know nothing about. <laughs> mysticism, right? So now, <clears throat> To understand what it is about, there are many approaches to the wisdom. Because it's been here for about 4,000 years, um, <clears throat> there is a historical approach to Kabbalah. And that is the chronology of event that led from where it was to where it is. 
Uh, because Kabbalah touches many subjects, there is the intellectual approach to the wisdom. And that is, what do all the details of the wisdom, you know, how, how can I collect more of those? But my presentation of Kabbalah is designed to help us access the spiritual expression of Kabbalah. And the spiritual means that at every level of study, we always, I always challenge the student to say, how do the concepts you're listening to, me, to you, relating to you, and how do they make you a better human being in your eyes? Because unfortunately in the world of religion, there's the tendency, or we have the tendency to be dictated to about what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. And even though we may be told the right thing to do, until we are ready to internalize and say, how does that make me, how does that add to me? We are often feeling uncomfortable with the what, and we'll get to the what in a second. But <clears throat> um, I am super proud to say that one of the unique, the unique values of approaching Kabbalah this way is I have all kinds of people coming to me. I've got Ashkenazic Jews, I've got your form Jews, Orthodox, Confer Conservadox, you know, ref every type, and they say, oh, by the way, and even Jewish atheists. I, I was born Jewish, but that's it, that's all I do. So now, they come and they say that after listening to some of the concepts that I share, I really feel I've become an enhanced human being, an enhanced, Ashkenazic Jew, an enhanced Reformed Jew, an enhanced... That means I am not touching their religion. I'm touching their heart. And if you can connect spirituality with heart, you've got a good recipe for a good diet. So, <clears throat> having said that, um, we are still speaking about many, many questions about Kabbalah. One of them is... Um, why to study Kabbalah? I know there's, I'm sure many of you heard, don't go near Kabbalah. <laughs> you know, Kabbalah can make you crazy, right? And there's all kinds of stuff that we hear, and the obvious question is why should we? And here's an interesting topic. Why should we study Kabbalah? Consider the following. If tomorrow at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, without a cloud in the sky, it suddenly became dark. What would you do? What would you do? It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, not a cloud in the sky, and it's dark. What do you do? Turn your light on. <laughs> turn on the light? How do you turn on the light? The light went out. All lights went out. <laughs> go to sleep. Go with the flow, you say, Thank right? So now, it's interesting because if something like that happened, I clearly, I assure you, that none of us would stop seeking or searching why that happened. Everybody, what happened, right? And there's all kinds of darkness. There is sadness, there's aggravation, there's stress. There is frustration, there is blame, there is anger. These are all forms of darkness. And unfortunately, when they appear in our lives, we often accept them for six, six months, a year, two years, sometimes decades. And that's a problem. One of the first concepts I would like to share with you about the Kabbalist is that they indicated we came here to this physical reality to live a fulfilled, accomplished, loving, tolerant, caring, and sharing life. That's our true purpose. So to the extent that we are not, it's not because it's not possible. 
it might be because we may have come upon inadequate composition of our experience that led us to feel the way we do. And the question is, how do you turn on the light? So having said that, um, we're talking about a teaching 3,800 years old, and history is not the point of this presentation, but I'd like to try something. I'd like to cover 3,800 years in about 15 minutes. Okay, can you give me some permission for that? Yes? Okay, all right. So now, the original document of Kabbalah is a very <clears throat> unknown and un, uh, not focused on book called the Book of Formation, Sefer Yetzirah by Abraham the Patriarch. It is a book written 3,800 years ago, and it contains a whopping three pages. I have no idea why they call it a book, right? <laughs> book, right? Now, what's interesting about this book is it indicates, or the Kabbalists indicate, that this book, this three-page document, enabled Abraham the Patriarch to live very powerfully from the inside out. Now, what does from the inside out mean? Well, I can tell you one thing. It is something we are not doing enough of. We're living from the outside in. Outside in means things need to happen out here or things better not happen out here in order for us to be happy. And that means you are completely ruled by your environment. Abraham the patriarch was said to have been able to manage his experience from the inside. The book of formation, say the Kabbalist, at, in, on a theoretic level, can give humanity an access to all forms of energies. Did you hear what I said? All forms of energies. So now, if I'm listening to what I just said, it's, a, it's suggesting that electricity is part of that three-page document, and it is. It's suggesting that nuclear power is part of this three-page document, and it is. Now, Yehuda, come on, we weren't born yesterday. These are recent discoveries. Listen to this. If I put the following equation on the, on the board, everybody can see it? E equals MC squared. For those in the back, okay? What is that? Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, to the average person like me, and maybe you, these represent five simple characters. But to the trained eye of a scientist, this will translate everything we call modern day technology. If you expand this equation, you will have insights about everything that we call the discoveries of our days. Why? Because to him, it's not E equals MC squared. To Abraham, those three pages represented a whole lot more than all the knowledge we have available to us today. And that's why to live powerfully from the inside out, imagine waking up and no matter what the news, you're doing great. You got a, you got a parking ticket. I'm fine. Your car was towed. I'm fine. Your wife said we're done. I'm fine. <laughs> now, this is crazy stuff because when this, these types of news come, we shake up. We are, we're experiencing an earthquake. Living from the outside in is full of earthquakes. Living from the inside out. That is, by the way, not just Jewish spirituality. General spirituality, if you want to rate yourself, measure yourself at how affected you are by the world and the news around you. If you are, 
less spiritual than you should be. If you're not, you're moving in the right direction. Spirituality, the consciousness of being the cause. So now, his wisdom wasn't written down. It was passed on from generation to generation. We stopped 300 years after Abraham the patriarch at a world momentous event, worldwide momentous event called the revelation at Mount Sinai. Now, why do I call that a world event? That's our event, isn't it? No, it's actually the foundations of the three religions. The three religions believe on a foundational level in the five books of Moses, the Old Testament. It's the foundation of Judaism. It's the foundation of Islam. It's the foundation of Christianity. Now, we need to understand something about religions because religions <clears throat> express themselves in two different ways. There is the physical expression of religion that is addressing the what to do. And religions love to tell us what to do. They love that. You got to do this, and you better do this. And if you don't do this, and if you do this, you know what's going to happen. Right? That's it. The what to do. But there is an expression of religions that is, <clears throat> that religions are definitely lacking in. And it has to do with the why. Why? Now, why is an important question. Please understand, the word why is the motor to life. Why is connected to purpose, and purpose can make you do things with excitement. Lack of why, lack of purpose, makes you do things robotically. And we do a lot of stuff robotically. We are married robotically. We're working robotically. We're living robotically. What does that mean? Here's an interesting question, because if you don't know the answer to this one, you got to start thinking about how to put the puzzle together differently. You know, we all better understand we are living in an involuntary game called life. Involuntary. How many people disagree with my statement? We're living involuntarily. Nobody, no, I'm, Maya must be good. Nobody's in disagreement, but if you think about it, how many of you remember being invited to the game of life? You're not invited, you're popped in. <laughs> popped in, somebody decided you should be here, not you, for sure. And then, go ahead, play. How do you play? Well, I don't know, I look around, and I try to play the best way I can from the people I learned. My parents, my teachers, my friends, my professors, my mentors. But you know what? Do they know? Do they know why they popped in? The answer is no. If you don't know why, you cannot be successful at playing the game. If you don't have a, a profound why. See, why, hang on to the question, write them down, but I'll, I'll have at the end, I'll have a question and answer se session. If you don't know why, <clears throat> then you can't play as profoundly as you should. If you do, then you will not go through the motions of being married. You won't go through the motions of going to work. You will go with excitement because you're connected to a purpose. There is a beautiful group of people that are busy with the question why, like, unlike any other group. Say it out loud, whoever said. Children. Children! Now, we are all in agreement that this is an innately spiritual group of people. And you know what I mean, spiritual? They're like an ever-ready battery. They never stop. Right? If you put them in front of a game, you put them in front of Nintendo, they can pay for three days and forget to eat. Right? We do something for five minutes, we're already bored. Why? Because they keep on asking the question why. 
They don't accept what you said. They might consider it. They might work with it for a while, but then they say, it must be deeper than that. And because they do, they're alive. You know, later on in life, you know, 16, 17, you start slowing up on the why. Why? Because <laughs> you're a smart teenager. You know everything. Right? Your parents are idiots. They don't get anything. <laughs> You know, later on, you start picking up and say, no, 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 it's not that way. I missed the point for a while. But what happens to most people? Most people fall into the routines of life. You're expected to go to school. You're expected to get grades. You're expected to do well in university. And if you did that well, you can get a good career so you can make money. Why? So you can attract somebody wonderful. Why? So you can have a family. Why? Especially these days. Why? I'm doing fine. I'm an independent. Why do I need a family? That's a complication, kids. Kids, complication. They're a complication if you don't know why. If you do know why, they're a blessing. If you do not have the why, and you know, 20 and 30, don't worry about it. You don't have to figure out why at 20 and 30. You have... 40, 50, 60, 80, 120 healthy years to live. But later on in life, you better have a more profound reason to wake up than, well, what are you doing? Uh, I'm retired. And what are you planning to do? Well, I'm coasting. I'm, I'm not planning to do anything. My planning was 40 years ago. That was my big project. So what do you do when you wake up every day? Well, you know, I'm... I'm coasting to the eventual lights out or the gradual lights out, which is worse. You better have a more profound way to wake up. If you are gradually waiting for things to end, you might be in a lot of lack for many years. This is where you need why. Why am I in this game? Why does it behave the way it does? Why does the good stuff happen? And more importantly, why does the not so good stuff happen? Why? That revelation, the revelation at Mount Sinai, was a profound second where humanity tasted its true purpose. Humanity, not just the yids at the bottom of the mountain, not just them. The whole world tasted for a second the purpose for us being here. But at the revelation, the wisdom of the why wasn't written down. The wisdom of the what was written down in the book, five books of Moses. The Ten Commandments. Commandments, you don't mess with those. They're commands. By the way, in Hebrew, it doesn't translate as commandments. Aseret Hadibrot is the ten highly advisable suggestions. <laughs> Not commandments. And you know why they are highly advisable suggestions? Because if you don't choose them, they're not yours. God doesn't need us to keep any of them. But if we understand that some of those, all of those, <clears throat> have depth and can give us access to pieces of us that are often asleep, then we would look differently at this interesting and very disturbing book called The Five Books of Moses. The why. The what was written down, the why wasn't. For another 1,400 years, 2,000 years ago, so the Torah, 3,400 years ago. 1,400 years later, 2,000 years ago, <clears throat> the main text of the Kabbalah, the Zohar, was written. And in his book, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, indicates that he's not writing for his generation. He's writing, he's writing for a generation to come. Guess what generation he was writing for? What? Our. 
hours. Now, he's, he's had some challenging approaches in reaching us because he wrote the book in Aramaic. I think there's about 50 people in the world who speak Aramaic. What is that about? Now, he said that he's writing for a generation in which why would be questioned differently than before. See, my parents, this is not, why is not a new question. My parents asked why all the time. You know how they asked why? Like this. Why me? That was my parents. Why me? Why me? Now, he said that the generation that we are in would start to realize that why is not an external question. Now we understand that we are, mere, we are experiencing, sometimes we understand, sometimes we don't. <clears throat> we understand that when we're experiencing difficulties in life, the question why needs to be, why and how did I participate in creating the circumstance I am in? What's my part? That's not an external why. Not why this is happening to me. Why did I help bring this about? By the way, when you are asking that way, you will access the answers that have always been in you. When you access, when you talk externally, you will have the answer on your nose and you won't see it. Somebody is at fault, nobody's at fault. We are designed to eventually take full responsibility don't get scared, please, don't nobody leave. Full responsibility for our experience. And when we do, life starts to change. My experience starts to change. Now, again, the wisdom of the why was written 2,000 years ago, but we weren't busy with it. About 450 years ago came along a profound soul by the name of Rabbi Isaac Luria, the Ari, without which we could not have access to the Zohar. And he began to write in more accessible Hebrew. It doesn't read like a magazine, but it's a lot more accessible, and we can start putting stuff together. About the beginning of the last century came <clears throat> a profound soul that would introduce the Zohar to modern-day world. It is an individual by the name of Rav Yehuda Halevi Ashlag. He is called Baal HaSulam, and he is, if anybody was going to approach the Zohar, whether from the religious community or the secular community or anybody, they would probably look for his translation um, that was completed in the, in, the, in the last century. He began to write extensively to help us bridge between the esoteric Aramaic and the day-to-day -day life of people living in the here and now. And he is a soul that is responsible for tonight. <laughs> we wouldn't be talking about this if we wouldn't have this access. So this is the end of 10 minutes. I'm done with history. Let's talk about Kabbalah, Kabbalah. What is Kabbalah? The word in Hebrew. Come on, Hebrew speakers. To receive, right? Now, he said that it would be relevant to people living in the here and now, so let's put it to the test. If it's relevant, it should touch and be concerning something you want. So imagine this. If you got, a, if you got an angel standing in front of you that is going to grant you a wish, okay? Would say you can have anything you wish to receive from life. This is the time to dream big, okay? What would you put at the top of your list, okay? Help me make a list here. What would you put at the top of your list if an angel granted you a wish from, <clears throat> to receive from life? What would you ask for? Raise your hand. Yes, dear. Health. Health, beautiful. Yes. Hello. What? Understanding. Understanding. Beautiful. Under. 
stand. Yes. Yes. Peace. peace. How much peace? Peace of mind. <coughs> Did you say money, sir? That's disgusting. How dare you? This is a spiritual event. Money. Fulfill, how about fulfill just your children, you selfish beast, you? How about s fulfillment? Yes, fulfillment. Mashiach. Come on. What? Beautiful people. Love, say you're beautification. That's almost the, I think it's a scientific, a unification. A unification. I'm sorry, I thought beautification. Okay, I'm sorry, I, pardon me. Love, beautiful. More. Cert how about certainty in everything? No. Certainty. Yes, what else? Mental health for all. The original, knowledge of original design. Knowledge, we said. Okay, wisdom, let's see. Understanding wisdom, how's that? Okay. Joy. Happiness. What else? Idealism. More? Music? I like it. <laughs> Music! Okay, beautiful. So now we have a wonderful list here. Now, yes? Oneness with God, but we don't, we don't have to come back to this earth anymore. <sighs> Oneness with God. Wow. Oneness with God. Yes. So we have a beautiful list. Now, it's interesting because for the past 23 years, I've been asking this question to all kinds of people. I teach religious people. I teach non-religious people. I teach spiritual people, and I teach people that say, I don't even know what the word spirituality is, right? And what's interesting about everybody's answer, with the exception of Mr. Finance here, There's always that one in the crowd, <laughs> right? So <laughs> with <clears throat> all the answers we got are intangibles. You can't hold them. You can't weigh them. You can't size them. Everybody, spiritual, non-spiritual, religious, non-religious, is looking for the intangible. Now let's talk to Mr. Uh, Smart ass over there. Just a second. So now, <clears throat> you said money, right? Who said, who said money? Oh, okay, yes, that's fine, okay. You said money, yes? So now here's a question for you. Is it the bill you want or what the bill can get you? Well, my, what I said was money. I got it. So you can give and share. I got it. Of course. But I'm asking you. Is it the bill you want or what it can deliver? Sharing is also. It's not, it's not, it's not. Well, what? Well, I, I'll tell you what most people ask for money for. They want power, control, security. They want the same intangibles. You're on the right list. Don't worry. I just neutralized money. It's the same list. We're looking for intangibles. We just think that money is the vehicle to get them. But we're still looking for intangibles. The main text of the Kabbalah, the Zohar, 
indicates that we have an infinite supply of all of those. Each and every one of us has an infinite supply of all of those inside of us. Ah, oh, come on, get out of here. What do you mean? That's infinite supply. Sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we get some of these, and sometimes they seem like they disappeared. Now, why? Let's talk about love for a second, right? Because that's a hot topic. Love, right? If somebody, if somebody wants to fall in love on a very basic level, don't get spiritual on me, on a very basic level, what do they need to do? What do they need to do in order to connect with love? Be open to it. That's too spiritual. On a practical level. Oh, that's, look how deep people are. How about dating? <laughs> dating, start dating, right? They, you got to get to somebody, right? So now, <laughs> yes? You need mighty to date. <laughs> You're right. You know why? You know why? Because the opposite sex loves power. Right? So now, just on a, on a very plain level, right? So you got to date, right? Now, how does the dating thing go? You, you go through people, because you're not going to settle for the first one you're dating, obviously. You're not a pushover, right? So you're not going to settle for the first one, and you date, and you go out, and you try once, twice, three times. Sometimes it takes two years, five years, sometimes seven years, sometimes ten years. And you know what? You did a good job. After 10 years, you found her. Why? Because you're able to check more check marks on that imaginary checklist of yours. You know that, that, that you know the, you know the, right? You know the one I'm talking about, right? So you're, she's able to check more check marks, and you, she is her, she, it's her. Why? And your knees are fluttering, and your heart is pumping, and you're in love, right? Now, question for you, how, how long will that last? <laughs> I usually have people going, <clears throat> <clears throat> how long will that last? Throw a number. Six months. Six months. We have an optimist. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Six months, a year, two years. We're not doing good on those statistics. Why? Because we don't understand how to activate love within. We're looking to receive love. We don't know how to be the way we were when we just started to date the right one. Remember how we were? No, oh, everything. What can I get you? Can I take it out for dinner? Want to go out to Paris for lunch? Anywhere, anything. Why? Because I want you. And then six months later, you know, you can open the door yourself. <laughs> we got it. It's short. I know. Right? So we say, you, you know, you can open the door yourself. You know, I love you. You know, uh, of course, I'll order the flowers from the same place in the same way every single time. And then <laughs> we fall asleep. And we fall asleep. And what's our favorite? Why is the relationship over? Because you changed. <laughs> Nothing with me. I'm, wonder I'm just as wonderful as I always was. I'm forgetting a few things. It's because I'm getting older. But that's it. This is what we do. Security. A lot of people say they want security, right? So how do you become secure these days? There is a world, there's a, there's a part of the world of finance that is called securities. Because everybody in securities is secure, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Why? See, securities work this way. You need to figure out to buy something that seems like a valuable investment. And you buy it, and you know what? In the first month, it goes up. In the second month, it goes up. 
In the third month, it goes up. In the fourth month, you see across the papers, Madoff. <laughs> and there goes your security. See, there's no security on the outside. There's no real love on the outside. Now, medicine. How about medicine? We, we want health, right? So what do you need to do in order to be healthy? You need to eat right. You need to rest well. And you need to exercise. Because those are three easy things to do. To eat well, very easy. It's not work. Oh my God, that's a battle from the second I opened the fridge. The chocolate cake talks to me. What is that? That is how we end up failing living healthily from the inside. We are the problem, but we don't know that we are. So if in theory we are supposed to be having an endless supply of all of these inside of us, why aren't we connecting with it? One word. Consciousness. We lack consciousness. See now, consciousness is an interesting word. What is consciousness? I'll give you an interesting definition. Consciousness is the, is the definition that we give everything. That is your consciousness. And there is 7.5 billion unique definitions of reality. Now, because our consciousness is general, we do not know how to hone in and connect with the built-in energy that exists inside of us. And I'll, I'll, give you, I'll tell you what I mean. You know, there is two people standing side by side. One is a 300-pound linebacker for the Miami Dolphins, and the other is an elderly-looking master of the martial arts. You put a block in front of them. The 300-pound linebacker will break his arm on it, and the master will whoop, break the block. Can't be physicality. This guy's 10 times the size, four times the power of this elderly looking person. What happens? Consciousness. Consciousness is power. You have it, you have power. You have limited consciousness, you have limited power. Now, here's where our consciousness fails us again. You know, I don't think if I say healthy body, health in mind, healthy mind, I will shock anybody at this day and age. Medicine is saying it. Doctors are telling you that. Healthy body, healthy mind. Or healthy mind, healthy body, right? So I got a question for you. I ask stupid questions, so listen carefully. How many people can raise their hand comfortably in saying, I have been anger free for a year? <laughs> That's exactly, really? For a year, the more. Come talk to me, come, on, come talk to me. No, really, anger free. Now please understand, if one person, it's the exception. Most of us are, you know, okay, I mean, I, I think lunchtime is a good time to say last time I, no, it's not days, it's not weeks, it's not months, right? Now please understand, these limited belief systems that lead us to all of these expressions, anger, sadness, guilt, blame, frustration, stress, all of those are eventually going to interfere with our immune system, with the innate harmony that exists in the body before you ever did anything. 
It exists in you when you are six months old. And you're clearly doing nothing then. If we develop these limited, limited consciousness belief systems, we end up eventually interfering with the essence, the power, the nuclear power that we have between our shoulder blades called neshama. Nuclear power, every single one of us. But that's when you are living from the inside out. I'd like you to take 10 seconds, close your eyes and ask yourself where in your life you would like to experience an enhancement of power, light, consciousness. Just take 10 seconds and make a mental note. In this area of life, I could do way better if I was able to connect with more light or more consciousness. Okay? All right. Open your eyes. Now, the Kabbalists are teaching something profound that actually can be verified by physics. See, in every process, there is the beginning of the process. And in the beginning of the process, there is the purpose of the process. In the beginning is the purpose. The Kabbalists share that in order for us to start playing differently than we are, more effectively, so we can have access to the infinite power that lives inside of us, we need to go to the beginning of our game. So when I heard that 20 years ago, I said to myself, they mean 1961 because that's when my game began. They said, no, that's not the beginning of the game. That's the beginning of your game. The game began a whole lot longer than that. Now, if we're talking about the beginning of the universe, there are two popular opinions on the market regarding the beginning. There is the scientific opinion, and then there is the religious opinion. Okay? So if you want to ask this question, you can go up to Mr. and Mrs. Scientist and say, listen, I know you have a take on the beginning. Do me a favor. Share with me your take on the beginning. Why did the beginning begin? She said, well, our version, says Mr. and Mrs. Science, our version began this way. Boom. She says, okay, I like it. I'm an open person looking for a why. Now, the only thing I ask you is, could you tell me why the boom went boom? And Mr. and Mrs. Scientist will very honestly answer you. I cannot answer you yet. I can tell you what happened three minutes after the boom and on. But the three-minute period and the boom itself, we haven't gotten there. Mr. and Mrs. Science, thank you very much for your opinion. Go back to your lab, litmus paper, microscope, whatever the heck you want to use, and come back to me with a why when you get there. So we got the world of religions. Left. Now here, why did I, what, what is that about? See, religions agree on nothing. Or mostly everything. They don't agree on everything, on mostly everything. But if you happen to ask them that question, you can ask that to the rabbi, you can ask that to the priest, and you can ask that to the mufti. And they will all come back to you with a beautiful answer. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Oh, I love it. Why? Because I'm an open person. I'm open. Now, just a little tiny question for you, Mrs. Mr. Mrs. Religion. <laughs> Why did in the beginning God create the heaven and the earth? Now, when you ask this question to the world of religion, you become the instant infidel. They look at you with a raised eyebrow and ask you, you, you have the chutzpah to ask God why? No, no I, I'm not asking him. I'm asking one of his servants here. Just, I'm just trying to get an opinion from someone about why. See, 
We go back to the why. And we don't have a profound why. This presentation is an introduction to a foundational course. And as early as the second class of this foundational course, we dive into a profound, what's called the axiom, the Kabbalistic axiom of creation, in which you discover a whole lot more information about the creation than you can just simply read in the five books of Moses. It is all about that story, but it is an unraveling of profound universal metaphors and powers that you can gain so that you can begin to manage yourself differently than the limited result you're getting with the way you're doing it now. And I'm not knocking what you're doing. I'm talking about enhancing what you're doing. The most two profound, powerful words I've ever heard in my life that changed my life from the way I used to live to the way I live today are the endless light and the endless vessel. The most earth-shaking revolutionary words that actually apply to our operating system of ourselves 24-7. The, the more aware you are, of how those operating system, these two aspects of you, are interchangeably playing and directing you, the more profound your experience becomes. Endless light and endless vessel. I invite you to experience this. Um, we're going to have some information about a potential course. We're waiting for people to, to see the response of people. But um, I, I, I appeal to you in one way. And the way I appeal to you is this. You know, first of all, don't ever stop asking why, no matter where you're looking for answers. Don't stop asking why. Because the more you ask that why, the more chances you have to discover a truth that must get to you sooner or later. The question is, how soon? And you're in charge of that not the universe. So keep that up and always know that whatever it is you are doing could always be enhanced. I would love to open the floor for as many questions as we can get in. Hang on. Am I? Am I? You take care of it, Mr. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How does the Ein Sof and Basket of Souls Basket of souls? What do you mean, basket? That's how I, I learned a reference. Okay, it's like the collective it's souls? 700 souls or whatever many. Yes. How does that connect to what you said? I, I, there's a gap for me there. Well, there's a huge gap. I mean, there's tons to study in between, but uh, the endless light, go, the, the endless light represents the collective original souls that we are all sparks of. Of course. So, and the question is, how do we found, find our individual mission to be able to connect with the 7.5 billion souls that represent the organism we belong to called humanity? So this is a difficult, this is not a simple thing to do, but it's possible if we have that scope. Unfortunately, in the world of religion, in the world of politics, in the world of the regular 1% physical world we live in, we have a very, very, very broken puzzle of creation. And we're hoping it gets better and we don't understand that until we see the greater puzzle and work as individuals within it to make it more whole, we will not succeed. So it's part of our purpose to bring all Of course, together. of course. It, it's part of us purpose to bring ourselves and the rest of the piece, enhance the rest of the pieces to play together. Absolutely, yes. Yes? Can you speak loud? People don't hear you here. Louder. 
Wow. And that's what, uh, that's how he survived in the how, and that's what, you know, how he inspired. Absolutely truth. Absolute truth. A brilliant man with some profound example stories that empower people to live with a profound why. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Also, yes. So what is the particular role of the sacred feminine in the process of creation? What sure, sure. Okay, so it's interesting because uh, unfortunately these days in, in relation to um, masculine and feminine, we are so into the difference, we forgot what we're supposed to do together. When we understand the concept of light and vessel, we meet a very profound and amazing inspirational idea about the union of these two. You see, without vessel, light cannot manifest, and without light, vessel remains empty. It's an interconnectedness between the two and the maintenance of the difference between the two that create the circuit. Think about this. When you're talking about electricity, you have raw power in the wall. And if you want to lead that raw power towards something electric, you will use a cord. But the cord will have an insulator between the plus and the minus until it meets the piece of equipment. So why? Because the, the connection between the two can be problematic unless done in balance. This is the magical union that is designed to exist between male and female. One is, unfortunately, we are in times where we have to say it, one is not better or worse than the other. It is only when we understand the difference we represent and overcome that difference that we begin to appreciate what the difference is supposed to teach us. And then we, that whether we, we develop a lot of respect for someone we thought comes from Mars or Venus or whatever, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like we start going, oh my God, that's a necessary part of my circuit. I appreciate what this vessel represents to me and I can actually learn and become a better me if I listen, said God to Abraham. Listen to Sarah. <laughs> That's a part many, many people forget. Yes, please, please. I don't know anything about alchemy. So the cultivation yes. Of the raw metal yes. 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 So how does this Kabbalah? Is that the process? Okay, so now the, you answered your own question because you used the word Kabbalah. See, part of our problems is we, we are we are primarily or dominantly a vessel. And our operating system goes as follows. Wherever I go, we have a very simple question. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? I go to a movie, what's in it for me? Is it a good movie? Is it going to put, am I going to be happy? Am I going to, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? What am I going to get? Right? Now, in trying or in accessing the true fulfillment that we seek, we need to become graceful. We need to stop grabbing or wanting, and we need to learn to receive. It's all there. There's nothing missing. There's our limited perception that creates interference between all that the universe wants to give us, and that is endlessly, always, and the way we are receiving, which is sometimes and sometimes not. 
This is, yeah. Well, we, we learn about our operating system. The, the, tr the truth about Kabbalah is through the study of Kabbalah, you become intimate with you. And you become to learn the you you have never seen. You know, there are aspects of us that remain concealed inside of us and are not manifest and don't surface to our consciousness and we act with them and make decisions without using them. And that's a problem because we end up coming to limited decisions. Okay. So uh, we are going to learn Kabbalah and that will make us better ourselves. Why do, we, why do we want to become better ourselves? I have no idea. And by the way, if we don't, kiss on the forehead. Have a good life. No, there is no interest in anybody to enhance you in a way you don't want to be enhanced. No interest. If, some, if you say you are full the way you are, kiss on the forehead, have a great life. You don't need to. If you want to, great. If you don't want to, you don't need to. So my question is, uh, I believe that, that we need people. So how does, that, how does that equate? Because it's not all about you. Beautiful it's about question. you and people around you. Beautiful question. So now, yes, if we, what's your name? Sandy. Sandy says, She's assuming we need people. That's something that she believes. We need people. How does living or learning Kabbalah enhance our ability to better connect with people? So it's a, it's a very important concept. What I said before about being a vessel, when you approach everything and everyone in life like a vessel, there is the feeling that you want to be next to them because you want something from them. Okay? Our switch in the operating system of, from vessel to light needs to get to, I want to add to you first. I don't know who you are. You may want to participate and give to me at some point in the future, but my intention is to be and represent an added value to you. Now, please understand, if we went to Starbucks this way, we can revolutionize our morning in our interaction with the person giving us coffee. But we don't know that. And we don't practice that enough. If we did that with a waiter, if we did that with a judge, if we did that with people who can influence us greatly and influence us almost nothing, we will revolutionize our world because we don't understand that every single person in our life is a vessel that we can become light to. And it's easy to become light. You don't have to give them money. You just need to smile. You need to make them feel like you want to be close to them. That's it. If we did that all day long, you know, there's a, there's a test that they said, a psycholog psychological test. If you force your yourself to smile, at the end of the day, you will find a reason. See, most of us work the other way. We say, give me a reason to smile and I'll smile. <laughs> no. That is you being a vessel. You don't need the reason. You have laughter. You have joy. You have power. You have certainty. You just need to deliver those to others. And then you will realize that you're the source. What's your impression of the Berg's version of Kabbalah and the Kabbalah centers and the red string and the... I have been part of the Kabbalah center for 28 years. And in the past, I guess, Five to seven years, I've seen a deterioration of the boundaries that led me to say this is no longer making me comfortable to represent. The wisdom is pure. The 
application is as unique as there are people. And I've found that for me, it's no longer working. How do you bring love and life, life, light, happiness to someone who refuses it in every way possible outside of walking away? Um, how can you bring light, love, and happiness to someone who refuses it, for your fruses it in every way? Very simple answer. You cannot. Please understand, we don't get that the manifestation of the light is dependent on the vessel. And often we get confused by thinking that helping someone means doing something to give them what they want. That is not help. Spiritually speaking, help is the assistance you give to someone making an effort to make themselves better. And if they're not making an effort to make themselves better, you are not obligated and your assistance will take you and them down. What if it's a parent and you're supposed to honor your parent? Oh, honor completely. Do you know how many people you can honor by, you know, I have a question. Here, here's, a, here's a great example. Your child wants to have Kit Kat morning, afternoon, and night. Do you give it to them and say, have a good diet? <laughs> so the no is you loving them. Then, of course it hurts. Why? Because we are reactive vessels. We just like everything to be pretty and nice. And I want to say yes, and I want to give, and I want to love. And I, no, 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 no. That's not what you came here for. You came here to say yes, and you came here to say no. You came here to be tough, and you came here to be soft. You came here to love, and you came here to receive love. You came here to do both. And if you don't create a healthy balance there, then your love of self, which is the pain you don't want to confront, is going to keep you from doing the right thing. Sure. When he says it hurts to say or to abandon, you're not abandoning them, but it hurts to leave someone who refuses to receive. I said, if you don't stand that pain, you are selfish because you're just doing it to make yourself feel better. You're not doing it for them. And this is where we got to unwrap the package. And that's spiritual work. That's the difficult part. Yes, dear. Going in with going within yourself is the self-love and self-compassion my um, question was about that we it goes along with we are vessels of light we are physical beings having a spiritual experience we came in here as spiritual beings to have this physical experience and knowledge but within ourselves remains the light that was before and we'll go back to you said both by the way you said we are physical being having a spiritual experience and then you said, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, which... It's spiritual beings having a physical experience. Absolutely right. Right. But I sometimes feel it goes the other way. Well, it only goes the other way when your vessel dominates your light. And it's not happening to you. It's you doing it. So that's a very important concept. We don't understand. We are the drama in our life. We are the light in our life. We are the pain in our life. We are the soap opera in our life. We are the producers of our experience, no matter what your head is telling you. This is a, a little bit different than the questions that you've had so far. Um, Eastern philosophies have talked for centuries about the unity of one. Um, you mentioned Einstein before in, in his, his theories of relativity. From that came quantum mechanics, which has now proven scientifically that the Eastern mystics and Eastern philosophers were absolutely right. Absolutely. What is the Kabbalah? How does that fit into that, um, into that paradigm? I mean, I, I would assume that it would agree, but I, you know, I haven't not studied it. Ev every... 
true wisdom, uh, he's saying that, the, that somehow modern day science and the advancements of science have proven, and I don't know what, where he's getting this, but have proven that the is Eastern mystics were sharing truth. So please know that all wisdom comes from the same truth. The question is, how do we put it together? In our, in our, in our uh, measuring of truth, we say there is truth and there is lie. In truth, there is no lie and there is no truth. There is the truth we are forming. And we need to keep on putting that truth together because it keeps on expanding our magnificent, endless puzzle. They all have space within the overall truth. Part of us ele elevating is stopping to say good and bad, happy and sad. It's us understanding that sadness is the vessel for happiness. Uh, wisdom is the, uh, sorry, uh, stupidity is the vessel for wisdom. And then we begin to, instead of saying, this is good, this is bad, this is God, th this one's spiritual, this one's an idiot. We have to start seeing how all of these pieces of the puzzle are actually necessary for us to experience. And then we need to put a puzzle of our own together, which is considered our truth. Now, as I said before, there are 7.5 billion unique truths. And we need to figure the one that is most relevant and makes us a better version of ourselves. That's when you get closer to truth. Just hold on to that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruce Goldman, and, I, and, and my wife and I have known Yehuda for over 25 years. We met him in Chicago. and have been studying with them on and off for all that, all that time in person, Skyping in, in different ways. And we brought them into our congregation, Congregation Beth Tefila this weekend, on, on our, you know, because we wanted to share him with, with our community and you people in this room. And because uh, he's meant so much to us and, you know, and, 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 and we think he can help a lot of people. Uh, so uh, I know that a lot of your names are on the sign-up list here. I mean, we're going to see if we can get enough people, and we'll bring them back in maybe to do a week-long class, like two hours every other day. He's got zillions of courses of Kabbalah. We've studied all kinds of things with him. So there's a lot to learn, and I know that it was, it's hard to talk about what's – you heard the concepts, but how to get into the concepts is what's important and how you can have it – get in tune with you some concepts stick with you some days I'll be oh god I feel great I understand this other days I'm going I don't know what he's talking about but you know but it's, it's a process and but it's a process that will all that always will enhance you every every time you try it so we're going to see if it's if we get enough interest to bring him back and we'll make him available to people if you just want to Skype with him and and set up some classes that way but we will send out a email blast to everybody here in our congregation and, and see what we can come up with. And maybe we'll bring them back and have a week-long cl class, a couple hours a day, every other day for a week or something like that, if enough people are interested. So uh, if you get your name on the list, and we'll get some information out to you. But thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. <laughs>